Honourable, he please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the nominee couldn't tell whether the Gwon government did anything constitutionally wrong. Yeah. But he says he will, if they have to terminate people who have do, been duly appointed or employed, they will do so. My second question is, Mr. Speaker, please, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, please uh, hold, on, please, Mr. Chairman, a moment. I think I ignore the latter part of his question. I want to answer it, please. Whether we did, we did anything constitutionally wrong, and the answer is yes. Under the Transition Act, you know, Act 212845, it is very clear that handing over notes should be given to the administration in a, a month in advance. So when you come to power, you just go there and pick them. On Sunday when we were inaugurated, the 9th, and we requested for them, because they should have been handed over a month earlier. There was nothing to hand over to us. They pleaded for Monday. Monday when we met, out of about 39 reports, we had eight. Then they pleaded for Wednesday. This, of course, breach, complete breach of the Transitional Act. But because you talk about constitutional breach, that's why I'm taking you. There were a lot of breaches along the line of the, of the act. Well, the breach of the Transition Act. Yes. Thank you, We're talking Mr. about nominee. constitution. Please, the Mr. Act nominee, the don't act. engage in any exchanges. Can you please ask your second question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, page 17 of MPP Manifesto, uh, 2016, talks about uh, reducing the 17, reducing the corporate tax rate from 25 to 20 percent, abolishing the special import levy, abolishing the 17.5 percent VAT on imported uh, medicines not produced in the country, abolishing the 17.5 percent VAT on financial services, abolishing the 5 percent VAT on real estate sales, abolishing the 17.5 percent VAT on domestic airline tickets. Then when it goes to page 18, I, they will seek to broaden tax base as a result of formalization of the economy. After abolishing a lot of the tax components, you are seeking to broaden the tax base. Can the nominee tell us the areas which they are seeking to broaden their task to cover so that Ghanaians can prepare for, uh, to pay for those taxes yet to be introduced. Can you be specific on some on areas where they will impose taxes on? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, when you talk about broadening tax rate, it means that instead of Taxing 100 people, you will be looking for 150. You are taking steps to broaden. Now, if you reduce from 25 to 20, the consequential report could be many more people voluntarily coming in to pay tax who have been dodging. So that will broaden the tax base. Now, that could broaden. Now, let, 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 let me finish. Let me finish. I hear, let me finish. I hear, when you talk about reducing the VAT on micro and small scale from 17.5 to 3, you would definitely broaden the base because a lot more people who were dodging the 17.5 will come in and pay the 3. That's what you mean by broadening. You, 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 are, you are going to, more people will come in. So that's, that's what will happen. And look, we have a housing, serious housing deficit. Why would you be taxing 5% on rare estate. We think that it becomes a nuisance tax in respect of housing. So you remove it and more people will put up and you solve another problem of housing. When you, 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 you broaden, you are bringing more people into the tax net. That's what we mean by broadening. Mr. So Honorable Member, you are just asking more people to come into the tax net. That's what we mean. You bring it down, more people come into the net. And that is broadening. We are not talking about increasing. You bring more people in. Mr. Chairman, I think the nominee did not 
understand my question. Um, because, honorable Samson, please, 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 please. Can, you, can you listen to me, please? You asked him a question, he has answered. You have one more opportunity, please go ahead. This is not fair. <laughs> this is not fair. This is not fair. This is not fair. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, uh, last year we were all together being vetting and uh, Anyway, anyway. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the honorable no, nominee told us that as a senior minister, he's been asked to coordinate the economic ministry. Yes, ministries. We will, we have a ministry for planning. We have Ministry for Ministry for Monitoring and Evaluation. Mr. Chairman, I want to find out from the Honorable Nominee whether these portfolios are not going to contradict themselves and not duplicate their functions. Um, if we may get a clarification. The nominee said that he is to coordinate the economic sector. That is not the same as monitoring and evaluation ministry. Yes, ministries is only a small sector of the entire. Hello, can you give us some order, please? But you are also contradicting what he said, so we can't keep trying to allow you to say it. That is a fact. You let him answer or you overrule it, but you don't go answer. So you are also trying to answer. If leadership would not respect the chair, we may probably cede chairmanship to you. No, the chair must Please. Himself. The chair will have to respect himself. You must answer the question. Ah, what is this for? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, may I, may I, may I appeal to colleagues that when we meet at a committee level, you should abide by the spirit of consensus, and it's not nice to be throwing jibes here and there. It is not. It is not. And I thought that the question that was being asked by my colleague, the uh, Honourable Ahi, is germane except to say that when he premised his question on the fact that uh, there are certain ministries and refers to monitoring and uh, evaluation, there's no ministry like that. He would say that maybe there is a minister in charge. It doesn't necessarily mean that a ministry has been created. So if you could premise the question well, then maybe the, the, the nominee could answer. Can the nominee clarify where his coordination is to, for the benefit of members and the questioner, please? Mr. Chairman, I think you got me right. When I talked on several occasions about economic ministries, uh, coordinating the work of economic ministries, there is a, if there is a minister for coordinating and evaluation, Assuming we want to follow up on our one district, one factory, and somebody should follow and give report to the president, that would be there. That's different from my coordination of the economic ministries. Very different. So there, there's, there's no there's crossing. Now, would you want to continue? Please review your question so that the uh, nominee will answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the Honorable Nominee told us that he's been asked to coordinate the economic ministries. Now, we have a Minister of State in charge of planning, which is part of uh, 
economic activities in the country. And I want to find out from the nominee what would be the relationship between his role and these ministers of state who are going to be in charge of monitoring and evaluation and planning. Is that not going to be a duplication of functions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think earlier on you came, when you talk about planning, it's talking about planning for the whole economy, not only the economic ministries. I will restrict myself in the coordination with economic ministries. We talk about planning, and the planning is the only ministry which also defined in detail in the Constitution. But there are many people who are arguing that the planning is a, a, a super minister because everybody takes his feet from it. And therefore, there will be no overlapping, as far as I'm concerned. Evaluation and monitoring of what? Of projects which will be assigned to him by the presidency. And I think we wait till we get there. Thank you. We'll come back to my left. Honorable Nitu, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I will just congratulate the nominee for reasons obvious to all Ghanaians. I recuse myself or ask permission not to ask a question. Thank you. For today, only today. Tomorrow, I'll, I'll be sitting here to ask questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> My questions are very simple ones. The first one is, what will be the relationship between his coordination of the economic ministries and the economic management team that is headed by the vice president. I mean, some people are worried that um, this seeming confusion about rules will be in itself a problem in managing your economy. What do you say about that? Thank you very much. Well, the economic management team has met already four times. The first three under the chairmanship of the president himself, and the third next one under the chairmanship of the vice president. And we define our terms of reference very well. And so far, there is no problem between the role of the economic management committee. I report to them in respect of findings, because as much as possible, we want consensus. The economic management team has been people are not even ministers on it. It's not only internal. We are people we have invited from outside to serve on it. And we are looking at the totality of the economy and other important, like infrastructure, and how to choose certain things. So I would say, so far, it's doing very well. There's no problem. Chairman, sorry, uh, Honorable uh, Safo Mafo, just as a follow-up, economic management team have met four times. Yes. Who were the members of that uh, EMT, and uh, when did they meet? Can you just share with us who met as economic management team? Yes, Mr. Zafo. I would say that the first meeting was held on the second day when we came to power because the president was so keen about us understanding our roles and understanding the data that we should look for in managing the economy. And we invited then the Minister for Agriculture, the Minister for Trade and Industry, oh, not the Minister designate. Designate for agriculture, sorry. Designate for uh, trade and industry. Uh, myself, finance, the vice president, and two other people from outside who were brought in by assistant the vice president from his office to assist. And then later, 
we also brought in a third person also to assist. So it's okay. Very well, Honorable Yelecha, continue. Mr. Chairman, I, <laughs> the way he has talked, <laughs> I think it was a proposed management <laughs> <laughs> not <laughs> actual, because they are designated. <laughs> but you see, let's go back to his designation as senior minister, because the constitution says minister of state. And then the president adds you the portfolio. So wait, I am coming to the point. You see, for me, I would have preferred where you don't pre precede the minister with the senior. Because we all know, when you enter any office, you ask for the senior person there. <laughs> and having worked with the IMF and World Bank, he knows. When they say senior manager, they mean somebody higher than the other managers. So for me, to say that you are the same and you don't have other powers, the word senior itself implies power and <laughs> authority, higher than that. So I believe that if the president really didn't want us to create a confusion in the constitution, with the constitution, what we should be talking about, minister of state for coordinating economic ministry. <laughs> because <laughs> some of the ministries he has created are more full, inner cities and zongos. <laughs> so that, to me, would have solved this problem. But to say senior doesn't mean anything, but that you are co-equal, I don't believe that. How do you see it? Well, I, I don't think there's a question in it. So we thank you for your opinion. Do you, can you proceed to ask another question, please? He has answered that question earlier, explaining the co-equal position. What your view is, is shared here. But please, proceed to ask the question so we can... My view, this is not my view. I want him to comment on the issues I have raised. So as a question. The, yes, that's the question. Now, as one to coordinate these uh, ministries, you have planning, you have uh, monitoring evaluation. All these are part of managing the economy. Don't you think there are too many uh, actors in the, the economic front? And what do you... I don't think so. The view of the president is that he needs that coordination. And he chooses to call the one who coordinates the senior minister. Period. Yes, Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. By way of introduction, I'm Jatu Michael, MP for Krachi East. I didn't introduce myself. Um, Mr. Senior Minister, uh, congratulations. I want to ask, um, we have a, a lot of strategic payment in areas. Granted, the uh, the Minister for Finance refuses to, by the previous government, granted the Minister for Finance refuses to pay this uh, uh, when he assumes office. You as the coordinator, so to speak, the minister, uh, the, uh, what will be your role in making sure that these statutory payments are, are made? Why do we have the statutory payments in areas? They are in areas because the liquidity is not there to pay, as of now. And therefore, there is a problem. It's a problem of liquidity. When the new minister comes, I cannot create liquidity when there is no liquidity. So I cannot just go and say pay, when indeed he has not got the financial muscle to pay. So we have to, because they are statutory, this has happened before, we've got to try to improve on our revenue performance reduce certain expenditures, and settle the site repayment because they are statutory. And I believe that we must respect the site repayments. It's a must. But at the moment, they are in areas because your cash flow is poor. We have to improve the cash flow and get them sorted out. And that will be done by the Minister for Finance when it's approved. Your next question. Thank you very much. Your CV tells me that... Um, you are an engineer by profession. And uh, from 1967 to 69, 
you were in charge of uh, process and quality control of the Valco. Now you are going to control the uh, uh, co uh, co coordinate the economic sectors of this uh, government. Will you tell us what you do in making sure that Valco comes to life? I think Valco's problem is power. It's availability of power for them to come to power. It's I've not studied it in depth what we should do, but when we get the bridge, we'll cross it. But as much as it is, it will be my wish that VACO operates. We need VACO because we need to push the aluminum integrated project concept. We have a lot of bauxite, and we must go back and integrate it by converting our bauxite into alumina to enable VACO use our produced alumina to do the aluminum. So it's, it's, a, it's a, an integration the government has mentioned in the manifesto, and therefore VACO will be encouraged to operate. We'll have to find ourselves their power, and I think we'll do it. Thank you. I'm left with the last one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, coming from Volta region, we're talking about the growth of the economy, and the, the growth of the economy... Oh, Yes, the question is coming from Volta region. It's about the growth of the economy, and it's a holistic, in a holistic approach. We know that Volta region is under-resourced under in terms of industrial development. How do you help all the sectors to make sure that at least um, Volta region also see a fair growth in terms of... Uh, uh, industrial uh, development. Thank you very much. There are two things which we introduce in our manifesto, which is going to have some equity and equilibrium. When you're talking about one district, one factory, then every district in the country, including those in the voter region, will benefit from it. When we talk about $1 million per constituency, it is also the same. And this is meant to enable those in the voter region to also decide on how to apply it. So I would say that we're trying to make sure that there is uniformity in the development. And therefore, this is a very good startup, and we should all push it to bring those behind into uh, the center. So voter will get its fair share based on these policies of ours. Thank you. Um, Honorable Matthew Pogu let it pass. Honorable Esther, uh, sorry, Esla Usu. I have just one question. The question is, Doctor. <laughs> May I congratulate the Honorable Asafu Mafu, who happens to be my uncle, for. Oh. Let it pass. I am just asking a simple question, please. Yes. Are you for yourself? Yes, I am. Um, I notice from your CV that you don't say anything about what other role you may have occupied in, as a traditional ruler. So I'd like to know if you were ever a traditional ruler, because I don't see it on your CV. You, think it's you may recall that uh, I abdicated to enable me contest elections for, as MP for Akimoda. So uh, it, it's no more significant. That's why I didn't talk about it. But I was once a traditional ruler. I was, I was once a chief. Significant to those who you led. So I would have wished to see it. Oh, okay. okay. Next, next time I'll put it there. Thank you very much. No further questions. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, um, maybe let me just take it off from where uh, Honorable Osler uh, left off. Going through your CV, I noticed that uh, after your first degree uh, at the University of Science and Technology, where you had uh, BSc in Mechanical Engineering, you never really bothered yourself to pursue any further degrees. Uh, but you have an impressive, uh, you know, working career. And maybe on another platform, 
I would want your guidance, especially as we have a lot of people now who even in offices sometimes rush out of their offices, uh, you know, to pursue other degrees. Uh, I would perhaps on another platform, I would like your guidance on that to help us. But to my substantive questions, first on the economic, on the fact that you are to be coordinating um, the economic ministries. I noticed that an earlier question had to do with your role vis-a-vis -vis the role of the economic management team. And given your record and record of other members such as Honorable Osaya Koto and uh, Kwame Penim in the past, as far as the history and record of the NPP administration is concerned, uh, I was wondering what the role of the economic management team will be vis-a-vis -vis your role, but I think you have touched on it. But still on the economy, you answered a question relating to fiscal space, relating to fiscal space, and the fact that you will renegotiate the IMF deal to create, as you put it in your words, physical space. So my question to you is, is that an indication that your government, led by Nana Kufuadu, will be borrowing, President, President Nana Kufuadu will be borrowing more. This is a very important question. Now there is refinancing arrangement in managing an economy. If I owe 100 cities, and I'm to repay it in three years. If I'm able to get 100 CDs to be repaid in 10 years, to substitute, I create myself a fiscal space because the repayment schedule will be very different and I'll get extra money to spend because I have rearranged the debt. And therefore, our negotiation will go from many directions, including reborrowing to refinance and be going to refinance on better terms, better in terms of repayment period, in terms Mr. of Chairman, if you indulge me, my question is a simple one, sorry. No, I just wanted to, because he wasn't answering the question, so I just wanted to draw your attention. Oh. Honorable member, the rule is that you permit the nominee to answer. You have three opportunities, so you can, okay. I just wanted to know if you'll be borrowing more. That's the question. If you'll be borrowing the more. The question is that we'll be borrowing certainly, but under different arrangements. And I explain it, that you want to borrow to refinance such that you have room or space to operate. Because you're not paying a loan in five years. You are paid off that loan, but you have to repay the next one in 10 years. So there will be less cash outflow, and you, therefore you create fiscal space for yourself. Borrowing more, certainly, but differently. And you borrow to refinance, to change your whole uh, debt profile. That's what you are seeking to do. Thank you. To my second question. Honorable nominee, you have worked in government before, and this question has to do with management of state assets and the view of the public, especially when it comes to how politicians appropriate such assets. Now, I want your view, and this is especially important, like I stated, because you've worked in government before, you've managed the state assets. And again, quite recently, there was a discussion of how the former president, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, you know, was to be allowed to stay in his uh, residence as his entitlement. Honorable member, our rules do not permit questions that elicit views and opinions. Okay, so, so I'll rephrase. I'll rephrase. I'll rephrase. I'll rephrase. I'll rephrase. Chairman, okay, please, information. Now, Mr. Chairman, the question is this. Mr. Chairman, uh, if I may supply some information. Okay. Since the colleague is alluding to something that he was not party to. We agreed, the parliament of um, the previous parliament, the sixth parliament, agreed that the president from now on should be provided with a residence. 
and an office. Parliament did not say that the residence the, that he's occupying now should be given to him. Please, let's make that distinction. No, no, please, please. The report, because that is premised on the committee that the president set up under Article 71 of the Constitution. Our parliament, in its wisdom, decided to amend the provisions contained in that. And nowhere did parliament say that the president, the former president, should be allowed to occupy the residence, the official residence that he's occupying. I think for ma as a matter of record, we should state it. Nobody said so. That was what he said. I did not make reference to Parliament, and I and 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 I, I am grateful. Can you, can you ask your question, please? Now that's that's my second question, right, Mr. Chairman? Okay. No. Um, the question is, I have before me the transition team report of 2009, and in it, there was supposed to be a government infilling scheme. And as part of that scheme, a number of government functionaries at the time benefited from the state lands. Your name is one of such beneficiaries. Again, I have before me a letter that was written by the former chief of staff. And in that letter, reference is made to you, the former chief of staff, the immediate former chief of staff, Mr. Julius Debra. And in that letter, reference is made to you by name. And it had to do with a discussion that you had with that government, with the previous government or functionaries of the previous government on 19 December 2016 on where the former president was supposed to reside. So the question is, did this meeting take place? Did this agreement happen? And what is your view on the concern that the general public have expressed about how politicians appropriate state assets? Thank you. Thank you very much. The presidential transition team works as a team. There's a joint chairman that is the chief of staff, Adcon chief of staff, and myself. He did speak to me about the wish of the president to take as his retirement benefit the house in which he was living. And I told him when he's around that this is a decision for the transitional team to make, not a Safamafu. So he discussed with me, nobody reached an agreement on the matter. And me personally, personally, and uh, I do not believe that people, not even at that level, but at even lower levels, should be given the chance to buy houses which they live in, which are normally official houses. Because, like, uh, where Kwesibuchwe lived, Kwampipra lived, I also lived. If any of them was asked to allow to buy, I wouldn't have a place to live. So I think that the whole idea of having houses designated for certain positions in the system should be maintained and should not be allowed for people to buy off. Yes, they did. He didn't talk about his benefits, the fact uh, that he's Oh, the plot? Yes. A plot of land, yes, I was given. In fact, I was invited, interestingly, I was invited by the commissioner for lands. He said a list had been submitted to him for him, my name was not on it. And as a former minister of finance, I was entitled to such a benefit. And he, a plot of land, and he reduced this into writing. And therefore, when you came to power, they even went further to write to me to confirm that particular plot of land. So it's quite interesting. And I will produce that letter to you, signed by Mr. Adami. Thank you. My last question. Thank you very much. Um, I noticed that when Madame Oslausu talked about the fact that you were a chief before, she, she said so with pride, because you are an uncle. 
that tells me that despite the fact that you are, like myself, a proud Ghanaian, you're also very proud of your cultural heritage. Now, given the fact that some questions on the floor have been asked, I mean here have been asked based on discussions conducted on social media and the traditional media, I wish to find out from you if it is correct that you are on record without your knowledge to have suggested that the management of this country's resources should be put in the hands of those who come from five rich resource regions. And it is unfair for anyone who does not come from any of these five regions to be made responsible for managing the resources of this country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This is one of these distorted paste and cast statements. I am the chairman of the Council of Elders of the NPP in the Eastern Region. We are fighting this election on the economy. And I was giving a series of lectures on the economy and to various groups within the region. When it got to the turn of the Council of Elders, me the chairman, the regional chairman spoke, Honorable Hackman spoke, I spoke and I spoke on the economy. Now you don't talk about the economy by starting with the resource location. I started with, I'm just telling you how the thing was distorted and put out of context. I started by talking about how poorly this economy has managed, that we have gone from 9.4 billion debt to 110 billion debt at the time, and how growth without oil was 9.1 billion and has dwindled to about 4%. And etc. 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 And I said something which I have said in this room that Ghana is not poor, and that the resource base of this country is found in five regions. And I mentioned the regions specifically. I was making a strong economic argument. Now people removed all that I said about the poor management of the economy, and then made it look like I started by talking about the source of the location of this thing, and push it forward and change certain things to make it me look like I was being a travelist. I mean, and it was bad. This is why I find people very mischievous. When I'm talking about the economy, I'll start talking about where the resources are. Does it make sense when you're talking about the economy? Talk about performance of the economy first. You talk about the causes of the uh, poor management. Before you say, look, we are strong, and we have the full resources located this way. But if you take all the top part, you take the whole thing out of context and make it look very bad, travelistic. So I think, uh, yes, it happened. Newspapers reported something wrong. And I think people should be ashamed of themselves when they do this kind of cut and paste to create the wrong impression in the system. They should have brought out what I said about the mismanagement of the economy, because that was going seriously against other people. Nobody talked about it. Honorable member for Efia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Honorable Minister Designate, um, I have taken care and pain really to look at your CV. And um, I can see you struggling to compress your achievement into a five-page CV. Uh, because it's so obvious, it's so obvious you've done so much. Um, my summary of your CV tells me um, your age and your profile exudes wisdom. And your question. I'm laying the background to my question. Your work, your KSC, knowledge, skill set, experience, really tells me of unexpected competence. And when it comes to um, your achievements, as outlined in the CV, 
I can see capability. And the issue about your role assignment. Honorable member, can you go to your question then? Yes, I'm asking. I'm asking the question. Your, the issue of your role assignment, that is coordinating a role and the des designation for the role, senior minister, has created a lot of discussion. In your view, is it a clear misunderstanding or not? Thank you. <clears throat> Certainly. I think the emphasis of my role as a senior minister was to do with my experience and my past performance and the wisdom of his excellency, the president. He wanted my experience to be on on his economic management. And therefore, this should not be misunderstood. It is very clear in the mind of his excellency, the president, that I have something to offer in terms of experience and exposure. There's no doubt about that. And I think we should give, give him that benefit and also allow us to continue to aid the whole country and the whole economy. Mr. Chairman, my second one question moment, has please. to do with... One, one moment, please. We are striving to close this by 1.30. Can I advise that members make their uh, questions concise, please? Mr. If Chairman, my second question... Asked, please avoid repeating the questions. Mr. Chairman, my second question is, um, Ghana is like at a crossroads at the moment, so far as debt levels is concerned, and looking at your CV, um, when you were Minister of Finance it, from 2001 to 2004, uh, you were actively involved in the debt restructuring of the country. At the moment, what current strategies do you bring to bear? beyond the strategies that you used to restructure the debt then? What current strategies do we have? Mr. Chairman, we are in completely different situations. In 2001, Ghana's per capita was $412. Today we are 1,400 and above. We are a lower middle income country. So the idea of going hippie to get your debt written off is no more applicable because we are not a poor country. We are a middle-income country. So it's more difficult even now to look at it than then because by just pronouncing HIPIC, we had 4,000 million US dollars written off. It gives you a lot of fiscal space and therefore made things easy. We are not there. For your information, our debt to GDP ratio, we should normally be around 45-50%, is cross the border of 70, which is taken as critical in the definition by IMF. We are 71.8%. This is critical because you should not exceed 70% in any debt restructuring. We are 71.8. The last figures from Bank of Ghana last week. And therefore, we have a problem. And that problem is scary. As for the strategy, you need an inflow. We've got to make sure that we improve on our revenues as much as possible. We've got to make sure that things work better. We've got to make sure that we want that anybody who does not go in for value for money, you know, in the big consumers, and we cannot even afford to look after health and education. That's the way I see it. I get scared when I look at the figures. And so we have to be prudent. We've got to be strict uh, and whatnot. Thank you. Okay. Um, in your earlier submission, you talked about uh, even financing the uh, trainee allowance, three trainee, less trainee allowance, when we reduce interest rate levels by even a percentage point. Do you extend the same argument to refinancing, to financing the uh, campaign promise of $1 million allocation to constituencies? Do you extend the same argument to that? It is not quite the same. Our capital budget is about 1.6 billion US dollars. Now, if we decide to give 
one million to each constituency. It means we are going to give $275 million out of it. So our capital budget will come down to uh, the, the difference. It's not going to call for extra expenditure. What we are doing is doing reallocation and giving the chance and the initiative to determine certain levels of their development. That's not going to call for extra expenditure. We are going to take it from the capital expenditure to give out, and this will reduce the money to be uh, used at the center. That will have to happen. Okay. Uh, use at the center. That will have to happen. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. May I use the opportunity to congratulate the nominee? My first question really borders on your loyalty to state vis-a-vis -vis party. It is on record that when we had the Century Economic Summit, you were specifically invited to participate, but you didn't, maybe because of party affiliation. Today, that you are in a position to organize such summit, another forum on the economy of Ghana, how would you persuade other people from other pol political divides to join you? Indeed, maybe if you had participated in that summit and had brought on board your rich experience, some of the things you are talking about today will not have occurred. So how would you ensure that you will or you get the other? Mr. Chairman, I'm being disturbed, Mr. Chairman. And my, my. <laughs> I'm sorry, order, order, please. <laughs> yes, I really want to know how he would convince us from the other political device to join in growing the economy? That's my first question. It is the method. See, earlier on, if you recall, Dr. Baumia has submitted to you through a press conference certain things that should be done. People did not only refuse to do it, but they hail insults on him. We have already put in the domain People have refused. So what do you want us to come and say again? So there was a discussion. And because we have refused to take advice which had been given previously, people did not see the need to come and give more advice. That's because by going to Senche, it changes the position. Because we have put this in writing. And, and, and it appears that people have made up their mind already not to take it. OK. Um. I'm not very satisfied, but I will take Please it. Please ask another question. <laughs> <laughs> Too many interjections. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my second question really borders on gender. Uh, we know that women constitute over 60% of the informal sector economy. Well, I, I go to Ghana. Um, Please ignore the <laughs> interjections and proceed to them. It's known, I mean, it's on record that the, if you go to all the documents, statistical data, and all. Um, how would you ensure that the ministers that you are, the ministries that you're going to coordinate, incorporate gender issues in their work? You know, so, sometimes we tend to overlook the importance of women in the economy. And I want to give uh, the chance to you to give women the assurance, assurance that they will not be left out this time. I think if you look at the 36 nominees of the president, the profession who are women is impressive. And therefore, we take it from there that as a, as, as a government, we are very sensitive about this. Whatever we can do to encourage women, to support women in the mainstream of economy, we have to do it. Because you said in the informal sector, women dominate. And if you want to bring the informal sector, which is in our constitution, 
that we want to encourage and draw the informal sector more into the formal sector. When you do that, you improve your taxation. We're going to do that, madam. There should be no problem. Thank you very much for that assurance. Uh, my third question uh, really is a light one, and um, it borders on age. Uh, we are all aging, and aging comes with some times we don't we don't, but also some challenges in our psychomotor activities, in our thinking, and all that. Uh, looking at your age, at, at your CV, you are 74. About a couple of weeks ago, and by the end of um, 20, by 2020, really, you'll be uh, getting to 80, close to 80. Uh, wouldn't you think, or didn't you think that taking a backstage as an advisor to the president in a more flexible manner would have been better than taking on a very demanding and hectic portfolio. You really need strength to climb stairs, go to meetings, and all that. So, excuse me, I need to finish my question, please. I haven't finished. So, can you assure us? It's just an assurance. Order, order, please, order. <laughs> Yeah, well, don't, don't you think that age will be a disadvantage to you at this time? We are all aging and we know what it means. Thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm lucky in a way. I enjoy very good health as a person. And people wonder what the source of my call it health and energy. And I think it's because of the food, the type of food I eat. Yes. Uh, well, I can't tell you. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Minister. If, if you want to come and see me in chambers. <laughs> but I think your advice is taken. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, my first question is, what specific policy initiatives would your outfit carry out and through which ministry or ministries? Since cash flow is a very big problem, our first area of call is the revenue. And we've already put a few things on paper and few changes to be made to ensure that we maximize our revenue. Because unemployment is also a major problem, we must concurrently be looking at the Minister of Industries. Already there's underutilization of capacities in this country with our industries. Some of the industries have literally closed down for lack of capital and that kind of thing. So we need to find some working capital and some long-term funds to push industry. For the transitional team reports, were requested purposely to identify certain, I'll call it low-hanging apples, things that we can do immediately to ginger the economy. And we have picked them sector by sector, because you must always make sure that you go to examination, you want to pass. I tell all my people, answer the easy questions first. If you want to pass, and this is exactly what we are doing. But it's revenue, and we must put a lot of discipline in expenditure into the whole system. And I think if we do these things right, for the first three months, we begin to get a few, some room for ourselves. We will also negotiate even the compact, the, the Millennium Challenge contract, we are going to look at it. There are certain clauses in that Millennium Challenge account that we don't agree with. For instance, if we ask government to pay the total death of the ECG, the city company of Ghana, and give it to a consignor to run, the question is, then pay it and ask the Ghanaians to run it. Once you take the total debt, 
management becomes easy. They are in difficulty because of the debt overhang. Now you are forcing government to pay the total debt and give it to an outsider to run. It's something that we have to look at, and that is in the compact agreement. So there are some of the things we are looking at. We, we hope that, uh, we, I believe, even though it has been approved by Congress, Trump looks so reasonable that he doesn't believe in, he doesn't believe in agreements which are wrong. He, he, he will support it, because it's not fair that we should, the government should find money to pay the total debt of ECG and bring somebody from outside to come and run it. Now, if you took the total debt of ECB and we found Ghanaians good management to run it, it would be different, wouldn't it? Thank you. Honorable yes. member, your, your oh, second okay. question. Yes, yes, yes. My second question. <laughs> Honorable nominee, from your CV and the languages spoken and written, you talked about English, Chi, and some knowledge of German. Yes. But I recall when you were the Minister of Finance, you signed a German debt relief agreement. And there was this controversy over the exact amount involved. Why some were talking about 230 million euros, others were talking about 16.4 million euros. And in trying to clarify the issues, I recall vividly some statements you made on Joy FM to the.